Okay, so if you have a Bible, um, I'm going to invite you to turn. Actually, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Um, it's going to take a few moments to get there because I've just got to lay some foundation. And so I've got a lot of work to do. Um, I want to talk about this idea of when heaven uh, collides with earth. Um, when heaven collides uh, with earth, or as I have said it in Cedar City, as it is in heaven, uh, it's something that I want to kind of uh, tease out and, and walk with all of us through over the next few weeks. In fact, it's not an original idea. Um, and newsflash, I don't really have original ideas. Um, in fact, no one does. There's nothing new under the sun, according to Ecclesiastes. Um, this is an idea from Jesus when he prayed uh, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, when he said, let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Remember that? That's what we call the Lord's prayer. So that's an interesting concept and an idea. And so I want to kind of lay out, like, what does it mean um, for heaven to be on earth? What does it mean for in Cedar City as it is in heaven? And really what we're going to accomplish is what it looks like for us as Christians and, and a church and specifically us as Refuge City. Like, what is, what is this our mission that Jesus lays out in this simple prayer um, that you probably memorized as a child, um, that let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and in our context in Cedar City as it is in heaven. What does Jesus mean when he says, let your kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven? So think of your idea of heaven. Maybe your idea of heaven is, is um, fat, chubby little angel babies that have harps and heart arrows. That's theologically incorrect, by the way. Maybe your, your idea of heaven is the biblical approach, right? There's no suffering. Um, there's no one who's lost in heaven, right? Because you're with Christ, so you wouldn't be unsaved. Um, there's no suffering. There's no... Um, Re relational uh, stress in heaven. Um, I could list out a, a million things. There's, there's no doubt. Uh, there's no unbelief in heaven. There, um, everyone is in their perfected self dwelling with God. That's heaven. So what on earth did Jesus mean when he said, on earth as it is, in heaven, it's a very interesting idea. Now, just hang with me because I've got some foundation and some, some work to do before we get into Matthew's gospel. In the Bible, the idea of heaven and earth is really like to, like, think about it. God's space, heaven, right? Um, humankind's space is earth. They are two very fundamentally different things, especially in nature, but what about when they overlap? What about when this idea of heaven and earth, when they collide? What does that look like? And, and more specifically, like what is Jesus thinking when he's saying that the space of God can be with the space of people? When we think of heaven, we likely think of, well, that's the place that I go and die, right? That's the place where you know, believers are, right, who have died. That's the place that they're in. But this idea of what Jesus presents, that on earth as it is in heaven, what does this collision look like for us? What does it mean for there to be an overlap? So we kind of get a glimpse of in Genesis. In Genesis chapter 1, we get an incredible view of what it looks like when heaven collides with earth. When God creates everything, he says it's what? Good. There you go. Somebody went to Sunday school or reads their Bible. Um, 
He creates everything. He says it's good. And you get this image of what the Bible would call the perfected shalom, which just simply means God's peace is there. So think about it like this. When we see this, this union of heaven and earth in the garden, there's no addiction in the garden. Uh, there, there's no suffering in the garden. Um, there's no political turmoil. Wow. Imagine that. Right? Like, nobody's voting for anyone in the garden. Oh, God. Right? Now you're going to begin to pray this prayer. Okay, finally. There, there's nothing like that. There's no lust. There's no... Um, immorality. There's none of that. And most importantly, God is walking with Adam. So you get this, this image of this union where God dwells and he's literally walking with Adam. And so this becomes a theme throughout scripture. Um, but what happens in the garden? Anybody want to take a stab at it? New, like, spoiler alert. Sin. Eve must have been really hangry because it's just a piece of fruit, right? And so sin comes in and just breaks that, what we call shalom, that peace. And so all of a sudden, now where there was a couple just hanging out, naked and unashamed, now they, they feel the immediate consequence of sin and they're ashamed. And so they cover themselves. So immediately this union between heaven and earth is broken. But then we get this idea or this uh, thing that happens in the Old Testament where God wants to make his presence known again. So what do they do? God instructs them, you're going to build something, all right? You're going to build what we call either a temple or tabernacle. And they design it in such a way that when they come in, it almost feels like they're back in that peace, that shalom, that garden where God is. So in the tabernacle, in the center of it, there's this place called the Holy of Holies. And that is where this union between God and his presence is made known to the priest. Now, all right, let's back up. Sin's still in the picture. So what do they got to do in order to enter into this redwelling or this union with God? A really crazy idea if you're not familiar with your Bible. So they had to like slaughter something. More specific, an animal, right? We're not into human sacrifices here, nor does God ever condone that, okay? So they take um, an animal, a sheep, a lamb, and they sacrifice it. And so that lamb then becomes their substitute. And it acts as this a cleansing, this sacrifice acts as a cleansing so that as the priest enters into the Holy of Holies, he is viewed as clean so the presence of God doesn't like blow him up or something. And so we get this image of where God wants to bring back his dwelling, bring back, bring back the union between heaven and earth in this tiny little place called the Holy of Holies. Now, crazy story of Israel, right? Uh, temples destroyed, gets rebuilt, and where does it end up? It's, it's in Israel. It's in Jerusalem. Now, a problem with that is, is that this promise for this reunionizing uh, of heaven and earth isn't just for Israel, isn't just for one specific demographic of people. It's for who? Come on, it's for everybody. You're a participant of that, right? Right? Like, if you are a believer, you have participated in that reunionization of heaven and earth. So, so there's the problem then. Like, like, if there's only one spot, and it's in Israel, and it's in Jerusalem, and it's in this temple, where, how the rest of us going to get into this? All right, here's where we, we insert Christ. Here's where Jesus kind of steps into the, the scene. In John's gospel, you can just write this down. In John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus is described as the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. And in verse 14 of John, chapter 1, the Word became flesh and 
dwelt. All right, so here's an incredible, um, and I'm nerding out on you guys, okay? The word dwelt here translates as, you want to guess it? Tabernacle. So, so God in flesh, Jesus, the God, comes and he becomes that tabernacle. Or, or in other words, he becomes that, that uh, collision of heaven on earth. Not only is he the collision of heaven on earth as the tabernacle, but he's also the sacrifice to, to make way for all people to be in Christ. To experience that heaven on earth, and it's through Christ Jesus. And so we have this huge um, theme of scripture, of this kingdom of dominion, right? And so now Jesus here, he is the embodiment of that which was lost in the garden through sin. Sin came, caused a divide between man and God. Jesus comes and he tears down that curtain that divided us that kept us from going into the Holy of Holies. And now we get to just walk freely and openly into this collision of heaven on earth. And the gospel of Matthew, Matthew's gospel particularly, a lot of the gospels, they have kingdom language. Um, Jesus uses the kingdom language. John the Baptist uses this kingdom language of that it's here and that it's now. Now, follow me for just a little bit in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 1. I've got it up on the screen for you. It says this, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, the son of Abraham. So here's what Matthew is doing right up front in this genealogy of Jesus. That Jesus, since Abraham, or since the fall, has been the plan all along. Jesus has been this plan that brings us back into union with God. Jesus is the plan that brings us back into this idea that heaven can be found on earth now. That Jesus was this plan. So God goes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, and he gives him a promise that through you, Abraham, I'm going to reconcile all things back into myself, and I'm going to do it through you. And Jesus is that fulfillment of a promise that took over a thousand years to be fulfilled. Jesus is the one that will come and fix our problems. Jesus is the one that will come and bring us back and give us a reality of heaven on earth. If you flip just a couple of pages in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, I've got a lot of scripture for you, so... If you had a Bible with pages, you know, that would probably be good, you know, because then if you're on your phone, you'll get like, uh, you'll have a squirrel moment and start checking Instagram. Mm, Y'all felt that conviction, did you? He says this, in those days, in Matthew 3, 1, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, Judea, and he says, repent for the kingdom of of heaven is at hand. Again, this is a dominant theme throughout scriptures is that this kingdom of God, this dominion, this reign of God is here to fix things, to not just fix things, but to make us new. That's a better way to say it. The kingdom of God is here. It's, it's now, it's tangible. You can, you can taste it and you can feel it. It's, it's here. It's to be had right now. And Jesus comes in the next Chapter, in chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus says the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus is starting his ministry and bringing back the kingdom of heaven. That which was lost in the Garden of Eden has now been fully restored for those of us who are in Christ. It's here. Jesus is saying that I'm the tabernacle. I'm the the redwelling of God, and I'm here now. So, what do we do with a message that kingdom of Jesus is here now? And here's the question that I'm going to wrestle with us, right? Is, Is the kingdom of heaven something that we have 
in the future? Or is the kingdom of heaven something that we can have and experience now? Yes, it's both. And you're going to see that as this collision with heaven comes on earth, there's going to be a response from us in how we approach this and how we bring back the kingdom of heaven. Flip over to Luke's gospel, chapter 5. It's the same story of Matthew, chapter 5, but it's a little bit more detailed um, that I want to kind of just... Uh, give us just a few nuggets of um, practical things of what this means for us and hope this makes sense. In Luke chapter 5, just one book over, a few chapters, verse 1. It says this, and I'm going to read through verse 11. As the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear God's word, He was standing there by the lake. He saw two boats at the edge of the lake. The fishermen had left them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, which belonged to Simon Peter, right? And asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he was teaching the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let your nets for a cash, a catch, not cash, cash me if you can, right? Um, just kidding. If you don't know that phrase, don't look it up. Master, Simon replied, <laughs> we've worked hard all night long and we've caught nothing. But if you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they did this, they caught a great number of fish and their nets began to tear. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at his knees and said, Go away from me because I'm a sinful man, Lord. For he and all those with him were amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, Zebedee's son, who were Simon's partners. Don't be afraid, Jesus told Simon. From now on, you will be catching people. Then they brought the boats to the land, left everything, and followed him. The only contrasting differences between Matthew's account of this is that Jesus gives them an invitation to follow him. And he tells them this thing right here. He says, you'll be fishermen of men. Follow me. You'll be fishers of men. And the men immediately put down their stuff and began to follow me. This is an invitation for them to become disciples of Jesus the rabbi. Rabbi is just a term that we use as a teacher. And so in first century, this is what discipleship looked like. For the disciples to follow the rabbi, they were with the rabbi like every every hour of the day. They followed the teacher. They listened to the teacher. They practiced the way of the teacher. Every hour of the day, they were with him. In fact, there was a blessing that says, may you follow so close to the rabbi that you will be filled with the dust of his feet. Follow so close to your rabbi that you smell like him, hope he smells good and bathed, and that you have the dust from his feet covering your whole body. This is what first century discipleship looked like. Now, looking towards the 21st century discipleship, it looks a little different, doesn't it? 21st century discipleship is primarily like, hey, let's meet for coffee once every other week at best, right? Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with with at least, if that's the time you can give, then give that time. But first century discipleship looked like really significantly different because you were always with the teacher and you were covered with the teacher's dust of his feet. And you did two things as a disciple of the rabbi. You listened and learned and you practiced what you learned. Don't miss that. You listened and you learned. I think like as I kind of culturally observing um, 
what's happening in the Christian church is that we have a lot of people listening. Like all of us, we listen. Like for me, for example, like I listen to hundreds of podcasts. I'm constantly absorbing information and content. Like in your hand right now is all of the world's knowledge right there at your disposal. And we have so much knowledge of the word, but there's a problem. We miss that second part where we're not practicing the knowledge that we have. Uh, The prophet Amos would call you a fat cow of Bashan. All right? You have so much in store. You've consumed so much that we've become spiritually just obese. We're not practicing what Christ has instructed us to do. That's this idea that Jesus is calling them into. He's saying, listen, I am bringing heaven to earth and I'm inviting you to be a part. I'm inviting you to help me with the spread of the kingdom of God. It's pretty powerful that he's inviting these Let's think of Peter here, fisherman, a nasty joker, right? He gets it wrong like all the time, right? Jesus is inviting him into, I want you to join me and we're gonna take heaven and put it back on earth through you. Now they would have understood immediately when Jesus said, follow me, you'll be a fisher of men. They likely would have understood this because Jesus was using a reference found in Jeremiah 16. And it says, behold, this is like hundreds of years before. The message is, behold, I am sending for many fishers, declares the Lord, and they will catch them. So Jesus is using this Old Testament language so that maybe perhaps they would really hear what he's saying then I'm going to use you and you're going to spread this kingdom message and my rule and authority that the king is here and the king's rule doesn't wait till some futuristic event to take place for some weird apocalyptic event. Then King Jesus shows up. No, Jesus is saying my kingdom is here and it's now and my rule is now and forever. And he's inviting you and he's inviting us to be a part of this collision of heaven back on earth. So what does that mean for us, right? So what does that mean if God is inviting us into, like, what's that mean? What does that look like for us? I think we get a few glimpses of this and just a few little um, nuggets of information from this uh, this passage, like what it looks like to follow Jesus and to spread that kingdom of God rule and reign now where there are no lost people. And I don't think that's a, that's a fairy tale idea. I don't think that's a utopian idea to believe that God's kingdom rule could erupt here in Cedar city to where there are no lost people. You may think that's impossible, but with my God, there's nothing impossible when it comes to his saving hand. Like, what is it, how does that, what does that look like for us? If we want to see like heaven and Cedar City, if we want to see addictions, like leave our area, if we want to see this happen, I think the first thing, a call for us to follow him would be that we just have to obey him. Like obey the commands of Christ. Obey what he says. Look what they say. Jesus commands them to do something that seems ridiculous. They've been trying their nets all around all day in different places. And I love their response. And Simon says, but you know what? If you say so, if you say so, I'll do it. That's obedience. That's them walking 
in obedience. And I just want to ask us and press on us if I can this morning. Like, what is God calling you into that you're not really obeying? What is God calling you into that, that would bring this collision of heaven on earth and you're just not listening? Maybe God's calling you to give your time. Maybe God's calling you to give your money. Maybe God's calling you to do something significant. And you just think, well, no, you know what? I'm not going to do that. What's God calling you to do that you need to obey that would help bring down this kingdom of heaven in Cedar City? Because your response is, God, if you say so. It sounds ridiculous, but I'm going to do it. It sounds crazy to go plant a church in Utah, in Cedar City. But God, if you say so. It's a call to obedience that Christ is asking us. You want to follow Christ? You want to see the kingdom of God here now? Then we got to obey what God is telling us to do. Another idea is this act of surrender. So if you look back at verse 11, then they brought the boats to the land. They left everything and followed him. You know what? You know, I, I harp on the disciples quite a bit because they're always like, they seem like they get it wrong a lot. But then again, like on the flip side, they get it right a lot. Because if Matthew Thror just had somebody come up to him and said, hey, you, follow me. I've got some questions. I'm, 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 I'm a little suspicious. Might I see some ID? Who's your mama? The important questions, right? Do you, you have a job? Do you work? Yeah, I do the father's business. Oh. Who's your daddy? God. Oh, so we have a wacko on our hands, right? At first glance, like, don't think that's like heresy or anything. Like, but I'm thinking like, brother man appears to you and tells you to follow him, and you don't have questions? This is so important. It takes surrender, right? It takes surrender. Yes, I will follow you, God. I will lay aside everything. And look what they laid aside. Their livelihood. They laid aside everything that had defined them, and that defines them. They put it all aside, and they began to follow this stranger, this man who's got these outrageous claims of being God, this man who is inviting them to see the collision of heaven back on earth. And these guys have more faith and more surrendering than I do. What do you need to surrender to Christ? It's also a call to change. Like they couldn't stay in this boat and follow Jesus. I mean, th this is a dramatic change in their life, becoming Peter, right? Peter, who is this um, just kind of a weird guy, burly man. Back in the South, we'd call him a redneck. You guys know what a redneck is? Hick. And I'm not judging. If that's you, cool. You're, wel you're welcome here, too. <laughs> Hicks are welcome. But just think, like, he's a rough guy. He lives up in the mountain, that kind of guy. And if you live up in the mountain, again, no judgment. <laughs> but he ain't got the cabin, right? Just a rough guy. And so his life changes, and he left it all. And he laid it all down because that's what following Jesus looks like. It's a call to change. It, Peter doesn't get fixed. Peter becomes new. See, that's the difference between a call to follow Christ and a call to follow the ideas of our society because the ideas of our society wants to fix you. And I'll give you four ways to do it right now. Step number one right? Nothing wrong with the self-helps, but if that's where you're getting your change from, it's just going to fix you temporarily. You want the six-pack of your life today? 
Try these four easy steps, and in 20 days, you'll be ripped. It's not an exaggeration. That's what society tells you to do. Just follow these easy steps. But Jesus is not interested in fixing the rough parts of Peter. He's not interested in that. Jesus is not interested in, like, helping him become a better you. Jesus doesn't subscribe to the, the cultural ideas of what today we subscribe to. Jesus says, no, I'm not here to fix you. I'm here to create a new you. And I'm here to bring down heaven on earth. And I'm not going to fix you to do it, Peter. I'm going to make you a new person, and you'll do it. What do we know of Peter? Brother man, right after the ascension of Jesus, is the first guy who was a coward, who denied Jesus, who doubted Jesus, and who failed him so many times. You think a fixed person can come out of the upper room and start giving a crazy long sermon and telling all of the Jews that you killed Jesus, you better repent. You think a fixed Peter could do that? No, Peter was new. And that's what Jesus was interested in. So a call to follow Jesus means simply that he will make you new and he will change you from the inside out. Just one more idea that I want to just kind of tease out for just a second is, who is this call for? Who gets to participate in the collision of heaven? where they get to dwell with God, where they get to redwell with Jesus and Holy Spirit lives in them. Like, who, who is this for? Who is this message for? Is it just for the Jews? Is it just for the, the 12 disciples that Jesus calls? Is it just for any of these? Um, think about in context of who's uh, Matthew. We'll go with Matthew, all right? He's the easy guy to pick on. He's a tax collector not viewed highly among the Jews. They're almost viewed as traitors. They would, they would pick up, they would, they would kind of pick apart the people who were in poverty and take advantage of them. And so who was that message for? Was it for this guy taking advantage of the poor? Was it for this guy who would steal from people and then like collude with the Roman Empire? Well, yeah, because Jesus looks at Matthew and he looks at him in his face and he says, you follow me. And he does the same to Peter. Can you imagine, like this is how my brain works. Can you imagine the campfire talk between socialist Matthew and conservative flag flying Peter? Mm-hmm. Who's that message for again? Yeah. So the challenge is, is that why don't we keep this to ourselves? If we could see the collision of heaven on earth, why would we keep this to ourselves? This is our challenge that we have, that we know the kingdom of God is here now. We know that his kingdom rule is now. It's not just some futuristic idea. Don't we want to see the kingdom of God ruling and reigning in Cedar City? All right, trigger alert. Don't you want to see the kingdom of God ruling and reigning in Washington, D.C.? Why are we hiding it? If Jesus said, you could pray to the Father, let your kingdom come and will be done on earth as it is in heaven, why wouldn't we pray that prayer? We need God's kingdom here now. Don't our marriages need that? Don't those who you know in the back of your mind who are suffering from addictions, can't they use it? To be, to be in that redwelling of Jesus. Those of you who have lost um, children or maybe your parents are far from the Lord, don't you want to see the kingdom of God like just 
collide in their lives and them surrender to Christ? So what all does this look like? Well, we'll get more into that next week. This message is for everyone. I want to share a story with you. Story time with Matthew always goes pretty good. I first, well, maybe this wasn't the first time. The second time I visited Utah, went to St. George. Um, it wasn't hot that particular day, go figure, because it was near winter. And Matthew, being Matthew, wanted to go see a particular building. Said particular building had a lot of people visiting that day. So we catch up with some people and we ask them, have you ever been in this particular building? One young man said, yeah, I've been in there quite a few times. The young lady next to him, she said, yeah, I've been in this building. The third young lady, ashamed, said, no, they told me I wasn't qualified to enter into this building. Hmm. Here's a contrasting difference. The message of Jesus is for anyone. You want to dwell with Christ, qualified or not, and likely you're not qualified. It's for anyone. That's the message of Jesus. And he's inviting us to take that and we'll see the collision of heaven in Cedar City and in Utah. Let me pray for us. Thank you.